uh, it is time for our final speaker of the semester. Uh, it is Ramadeep Gill. Uh, Ramadeep, uh, he finished his PhD at the uh, University of British Columbia, where he worked with uh, Jeremy Hale on uh, uh, plasmas near strongly magnetized compact objects. Subsequently, he was a postdoc at uh, a few places, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Physics, uh, the Open University of Israel, and George Washington University. He has been at area since early this year, so he's still, he's still green. <laughs> uh, his research focuses on uh, various aspects of high energy transients, uh, which he studies using both numerical as well as semi analytical techniques. Today, he's going to talk, us, talk to us about one of his areas of expertise, jets and transients. Thanks for the introduction, Sundar, and thanks everyone for uh, being here and people uh, joining me uh, on Zoom. Uh, so, the objective of this talk is uh, to give you some some sense of how uh, our understanding of Jensen Geo gamma ray bursts and GRBs, in particular the angular structure, uh, our understanding of that has, has evolved over the years. And what's the current status and uh, what efforts have been made and what need to be made, to be made uh, in order to connect the angular structure with observation, how, how that affects observation, and how we can use the observations to constrain uh, the structure of, of these uh, jets. So let me start with a bit of an introduction for people who are not so familiar with what GRBs are. So gamma ray bursts are uh, one of the, the brightest high energy transients in our universe, okay? They display peak luminosities as shown here <clears throat> in the GRBs detected by the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. Uh, luminosities uh, during their brightest phase, which is referred to as a prompt emission phase. And these go upward of 10 to 52, 10 to 53 ergs per second. The duration of the prompt emission is, is quite short compared to the entire duration of the burst, lasting you know, somewhere uh, hundreds of milliseconds to around 30 or 100, 100 seconds or so. And so the isotropic equivalent energies that you see in such bursts is around 10 to 52, 10 to 53 years, so quite bright. And it's so bright, this is, a, this is one of my favorite images. Uh, this is the whole gamma ray sky that you can see at any time. Uh, the, the emission from, a, from the prompt emission is so bright that it can outshine the entire gamma ray sky. So um, because GRBs are so intrinsically bright, we can see them at very large distances. So this is the redshift distribution uh, of two separate populations. I'll, I'll tell you what those two separate populations are on the next slide. Uh, but you can see that it, it goes all the way up to 9.4. That's the record uh, that we have so far of a GRB seen at redshift of 9.4. But most of the GRBs are found at redshift of around two. These are the long duration GRBs. I'll tell you what that means. Um, so, so this is a, this presents us with a good opportunity to study various you know, interesting things because you have such you know, bright sources at out to large distances. For example, you can study uh, star formation uh, with gamma ray bursts, fundamental physics such as the violation of Lorentz invariance uh, and other effects such as you know, constraining the extra galactic background. Right? So these are the many things apart from what you can study about accretion and how these jets are launched and all so on and so forth. These are the many things that you can study. Uh, so when you look at the duration distribution of these for the prompt emission, the brightest space, uh, you clearly see a bimodal distribution. Okay? And the dividing line between the two sits somewhere here between you know, two or three seconds. So aptly, the, the, the distribution in red are, are known as the long or referred to as the long duration GRBs and the one that are in the blue are referred to as the short duration GRBs. Okay. And this is not the only difference between the two populations. When you look at the hardness ratio or the peak energies that are emitted in the prompt emission, you find that the short GRBs are spectrally much harder. Okay, uh, Anywhere around one NEV or so, the, the spectral energy, uh, the peak energy that you see in such works. And the uh, long duration GRBs are much softer, anywhere around 250 KBs. Okay. So there's that difference. And this difference between, especially between the duration time, is attributed to the fact that these two different populations have different progenitors. Okay. The long duration GRBs are associated with the core collapse of massive wolf red stars. Okay. And the short duration GRBs are, at least some of them, uh, you know are coming from the merger of two compact objects. Uh, now those two compact objects can be either two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole. A black hole, black hole does not give you any such emission. So, so we don't consider those. Uh, and, and we have you know, now very good reasons to believe that this is the case because most of, or many of, 
the long your Bs are associated with type 1B, type 1C. These are stripped uh, envelope, massive wolf ray stars. And now we have very good evidence uh, that at least some of the short tube are coming from the merger of binding neutral cells because we've witnessed them. We, in, in a few years back, uh, in 2017, we actually saw the detected the gravitational waves from such a merger and also detected the pump short gamma ray uh, from such a merger. Okay. So, let's see if I can advance. Yes. So, the end result of both of those two uh, scenarios is the formation of a compact object, most likely a black hole, although. Uh, when you look at the literature, many do believe that there, it could be uh, a millisecond magnetar, a rapidly spinning, strongly magnetized neutron star. And either of those two can power, uh, or does power, in this scenario, a relativistic outflow, which first penetrates out of, it has to, as always, a confining medium, uh, penetrates out of this confining medium, and at some far away distance from the central engine, uh, it suffers internal dissipation, some kind of internal dissipation, which we don't fully understand yet. It could be internal shocks. We have shocks, or it could be magnetic reconnection. And the reason why we don't understand is because we don't yet know the composition of these jets. Okay? And what I mean by that is that whether these jets are magnetically dominant, pointing flux dominant. In that case, you, you have uh, dynamically dominant magnetic fields, and they will go magnetic reconnection at some, some distance, which gives you these prompt gamma ray photons or you have baryonically or kinetically dominant flows where you, they would undergo these uh, internal shocks and give you prompt emission photons in that, way, in that manner. So this is happening at your know, order 10 to 12, 10 to 16 centimeters away from the central engine. Uh, and we don't understand how it actually works. But what we do understand, sorry, is what happens as this relativistic, ultra relativistic ejecta plows through the circumverse medium. Which could be an ISM, a constant density ISM in the case of short duration GRBs, or it could be a wind um, type of medium where the density drops off as R to the minus two in the case of long duration GRBs. And as this ejecta plows through uh, this, this circumverse medium, it shock heats all the stuff that it collects. Okay. And while it does so, uh, it, it, uh, it has these power law electrons because it's shock heating all the materials. You form this power law electrons that are emitting synchrotron radiation. So there's no doubt about it now. We know exactly what radiation mechanism is at play and we fully understand the spectrum that we see from such a, and that's called the afterglow. And the beauty about the afterglow is that it's a long lasting thing and it is it emits the radiation over a huge uh, range of energies. So the prompt emission is simply the tip of the iceberg. Okay? There's a lot more that happens at much longer time scale. So this is, this is the light curve uh, for, uh, one of the very well sampled events, uh, GRB 1901 14. See, by the way, the, the 19 refers to the year, 01 is the month, and 14 is the date. That's how the convention goes. Um, and what you see here is the way you can tell between prompt emission and afterglow is well, first of all, prompt emission is short lived, but it's highly variable. The delta T over T okay, uh, of this, uh, you see all these rapid peaks, uh, does not happen uh, in the afterglow, for which the delta T over T is over here because the emission is coming from much larger radii. Uh, but what the thing that I want to point out here is there's a lot more action happening at longer time scale over much larger wave that's going all the way from radio, x-rays, okay, uh, and even finally, you know, this is the, the, the nice thing about this event is this is a, the first event uh, from which we detected TV gamma. So we hadn't detected, this was expected a long time ago that we should be observing TV gamma, but this was, Turned out to be the first event where we actually detect the TV with magic uh, telescope. Uh, so we know, as I mentioned earlier, that all this emission is coming from synchrotron emission. This one point I want to add here is that this TV emission uh, is suspected to be of synchrotron cell called an SSC, but there could be other things. So this is sort of open course. Uh, and the other nice thing about the Africa is that we, we understand its evolution. We know we understand the dynamical evolution of these relative states. Close, okay, that's just a relativistic uh, jet flying through an ISM with some density, density gradient. And we know how the bulk Lorentz factor of those jets scales as a function of R as it you know, expands. So knowing just these two things, we can calculate, for example, for a spherical flow, uh, how the emissions should uh, behave as a function of time. So that's all well understood. What is not understood and less clear is what is the angular structure of these jets, okay? 
Uh, all that stuff, which I showed you on the earlier slide, you can do that for a spherical so You don't even need any structure. Uh, but these jets do have angular structure, and that's what, what, what I'm going to tell you about. And so this is basically some of the questions in the outline of my talk. Uh, so what's the structure? What is it origin? Where is it coming from? Is it different in long and short journeys? Okay. Uh, can we tell? And how can we actually probe? So let me start uh, by answering the very last point. How can we actually probe? So you might wonder, well, why not just use prompt emission? Okay. It's, the one, it's the brightest part of the, part of the, the, the whole spec, uh, the emission. Why don't, why don't just use that to understand the angular structure? Well, it's challenging. The reason why it's challenging is because, as I mentioned, these are ultra relativistic flows. They're Lorentz factors of you know, order 100 or larger. And what that means is, due to the strong beaming that these emiss the emission suffers, which is displayed here, your, the observer can only access a region of angular size one over gamma, and gamma is large. So if the aperture of the jet, if you have jet flows and the aperture of the jet is, let's say, you know, 0.1, and gamma is 100 or larger, you're only sampling one tenth or, or even smaller part of the, the flow, which is like this. Okay. So you don't have enough information. You don't, don't have enough dynamical angular range to, to assess whether what kind of structure you have. But there is an important tool that one can use, which is linear polarization of prompt emission photons. And I won't go into too many details here. This deserves a, a talk on its own. Uh, but that can be used, and it's sensitive to the angular structure. So I, I will only say just this much. Uh, but you can do much better with afterglow. The reason for that is because gamma, as it plows through the ISM, it slows down. And as gamma slows down, this beaming cone widens. You have this gray region. This is your beaming cone uh, widens, and then you have access to much larger angular scales. Okay. So in that regard, afterglow emissions are much better suited to understand the angular structure. So initially, you know, this is like uh, early early 90s or mid 90s when people started wondering what jetted structures in gamma ray bursts. So one of the, the first sort of angular structure they consider the simplest and the most idealized uh, case is that of a top hat jet, which is you know, roughly looks like this, a conical sort of flow with uniform properties. So you know, as a function of angle, the emissivity or the energy per unit solid angle basically is just flat. And then it cuts off at this, uh, angle theta j, which is just the you know half angle uh, opening my angle of your jet, and then you can also have uniform sort of gamma across across the whole jet. Okay. And then people, well, no, once you start thinking about these things, people real realize that it was James Rhodes in his ninety seven work who initially uh, discussed this idea that well, when you have such a thing, then as the beaming cone widens and you the observer becomes aware that there is actually an edge sharp edge of the jet, your light curve must steepen because there's no more emission coming from larger and larger angles. Okay, there's no more energy being added. So and then I don't know, subsequently a lot of people develop this idea further, but the, the general idea is this that one over gamma, this is the size of your beaming cone. If it goes beyond the size of your 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 aperture of your jet, then you must see this happening. And then indeed, and then of course since this is a geometrical effect, it doesn't care about you know, either you, whether you're looking in optical, radio, or x-rays, it doesn't matter. Uh, it should happen in an achromatic way. It should happen in all frequencies. Okay? And indeed, we do see those things. Now, this is, this is, we don't see it in all the geometries, but we do see it in many geometries. And this is sort of, you know, one event sampled quite nicely in, in you know, various different optical uh, energy bands. Uh, and you see this, this break happening at the same time. Around. So it's achromatic behavior. Uh, and what this also meant that, you know, once from this jet breaks, at the time at which the break occurs, you can constrain the angle, the, the opening angle of the jet. So once you have that in hand, uh, you remember I mentioned isotropic equivalent energies. Okay, so that meaning that, you know, all the energy being spread out over four pi square radians. Once you have the jet angles, you can now bring those energy estimates slightly down. But how much down? Well, down by this beaming factor, which is just simply the solid angle of the jet divided by four pi, as you assume for the isotropic part, and you know by hundred or thousand, uh, you know two or three orders of magnitude, basically. And then the total, the true jet energy emitted in gamma rays must be around ten to the forty-nine, ten to the fifty-two. So it brings those estimates down. But if you look at this, what this also means now, this 
total energy depends on this beaming factor, which depends on your know, theta j, okay? And also depends on what the actual, you know, isotropic equivalent energy that you have to measure, right? There is some dispersion, some spread in both of those values. So what people wonder, but well, there must be a way to unify those in, this, in the same sense that AGN community unified uh, the different things that you, everybody was looking at, then, you know, in the end, it can be sort of interpreted as the same fact, same, same object, but just viewed at different angles, right? So people started thinking in that direction that, hey, well, you know, we can have a universal sort of object, same object with one energy budget, but now being looked at different, from different directions, different uh, inclination angles or viewing angles with respect to the jet symmetry axis. And for that, you would need some sort of extended structure, okay, a jet with an angular structure. And, you know, uh, this work was done in the early 2000s. So one of the you know, popular things that, that came out of that, those works and still currently currently being used is uh, the concept of a power law jet, okay, where uh, you would have a uniform core, almost uniform core, surrounded by this wing, this dropping wing in energy or and, and also in uh, bulk tolerance factor of the material uh, as a function of angle, okay? And then you can sort of try to unify those things uh, by changes in the viewing angle of the theta observed. Uh, so for this, you know, I will be referring to uh, the energy per unit solid angle changing as theta to the minus a, gamma changing as this big theta to the minus b, where this big theta is this. Okay. Uh, so keep keep these a's and b, the, these, these parallel indices in mind. And the other popular uh, structure that people consider was the Gaussian jet. So basically, there you don't have those parallel indices. Structure looks similar, but fall, you know, falls off, the wings fall off much more sharply. Uh, basically, a smoothed out top hat jet. And that's this uh, this Gaussian J. So I will be discussing both of these uh, in this talk. So now the question is: Well, where do you get this? What's the origin of this angular structure? Where do you where do you get that? I mean, does that make sense to consider those uh, profiles? Well, there are two two locations uh, where where it does. One's um, the structure of the sort of the incipient jet, you know, when it's launched. What is the structure of that? And then for the large part, what determines the structure is how it interacts with its confining medium. Okay, for the short duration GRBs, it is the, it turns out to be the dynamical merger ejecta. Okay, when the, these two neutron stars or neutron or black hole collide, there's some dynamical ejecta uh, in all different, different angles. And, and that also has some angular dependence. Uh, and then it is, you know, moving homologously, basically it's velocity scaling linearly as a function of radius. And where the front of this goes at 20 or 30 percent speed of light. The situation is quite different when you have uh, wolf ray stars, where there you have a static star, okay, uh, and much more dense uh, set star into which this that jet has to propagate. And so, what happens when a jet is introduced? Uh, it goes through a very complex dynamical evolution. So this. This one shows a uh, jet going through uh, to, uh, to a star, a wolf ray star. And this one here, a simulation, these are all 3D simulations um, showing, so this one shows the propagation of a jet and, and also the breakout of, of the jet out of this confining sort of dynamical ejecta in, in a short view. And that also has this complex dynamical evolution. And we can understand this uh, in this simpler cartoon when the jet is introduced, okay, uh, in, most of the cases in the simulations that people use it introduces relativistically hot in a conical sort of flow. And then it starts interacting with the, you know, for example, the stellar interior uh, and pushes on the stellar interior, shock heats it. You have this two uh, shock structure that forms at the head of the jet. One is the forward shock that moves into the, the, the star, okay? And one is the reverse shock that moves back into the jet. Okay, and, and both of these are shock heated material because they're not moving as fast as the jet itself their causal size, angular size is much larger. So they know that they can flow away. They can flow, so they're not really stuck at the front ahead of the jet as the jet is trying to push. So they do flow away from the jet and form this inner and outer cocoon, okay? And those two are separated by this contact discontinuity. And while this whole thing is going on, uh, the, because of the entropy difference between the two, these are, these are susceptible to relative instabilities, Kelvin kind of and most instabilities. And they start mixing, and you see all that mixing, all that mixing happening here. And this is due to this: how large or small this mixing is determines how shallow or uh, steep those parallel wings are in the end that I showed you previous slides. Okay? And there's a difference between the two that happens. So a lot of mixing happens 
in the case when you have a jet going through a star. Weak mixing happens in the case when we have a similar jet going through uh, to the dynamical Voyager ejector. Okay, and in a hydro simulation, so the, the, the results that I showed those are hydro simulations, and this is the asymptotic structure, angular structure that you that you expect or get uh, from those simulations. So top panels show you the angular structure in short journeys, long journeys uh, of, of the energy. Okay, the kinetic energy is a function of angle, and the bottom panels show you the uh, four velocity uh, angular structure, basically structure of your gamma beta or gamma as a function of angle. And so these results are taken from different simulations. So S1, S2, 3, and these LC and W here from uh, Or Gottlieb's work. Uh, and then the, oops. Okay, and then, um, and then all of these have different initial conditions. Okay, so there hasn't been done in any systematic way. Whatever worked uh, for, well, they were trying to explain this uh, GW1708 event. So whatever worked in that regard, they did it. Uh, but the, the, the point I want to make here is whatever initial condition you choose, in the end, you have some very common features that emerge in the angular structure. And that is you have an almost uniform core in all these cases, you see. You have this parallel means, okay, within some. Okay. Um, within some uh, some range, you know, this A that I talked about, and, and A for the long gear, these are they're different, and that the difference is coming from the mixing energy. So these are much shallower, and the short gear we want the steeper, and then you know differences also occur in the uh, angular distribution of your, your gamma profile. Okay, in, in the two cases, but in all of these cases, you know you see these common general features. Okay, so. Now, these are hydrodynamic jets. There are significant differences uh, and quite important ones that occur in the MHD jets. Okay, when you, now, so, so what, how do you define these things? Well, uh, basically, they're defined using this parameter called the magnetization, which is just the ratio of the entropy densities in the co moving plane uh, of the magnetic field uh, to the ratio to uh, the matter. Okay. So the hydrodynamic jets, sigma is much, much smaller than that. So they are kinetically dominated. And in the, in the MHD jet sigma starts to get close to one, and then you get more and more magnetically dominant. And this is when you have that. So this is a nice uh, compilation of uh, simulation results from, from again from Orr, Orr's work, uh, where you start with sigma out of zero. Here you see all this larger angular structure. But what happens when you go to larger sigma? Your jets are becoming more and more core dominant. All the wings are dropping down quite steeply. And this, the reason for that is because these magnetic when you have magnetic fields, they suppress those instabilities, the R, E, I, D, relative instabilities are suppressed. So you don't have all that mixing happen. And that's the reason why you get much sort of, you know, almost close to a power pad gym, such a case. Uh, sorry, 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 what's the WM? These are the entropy densities. Entropy density of the magnetic field and entropy density of the matter. Magnetic field ent entropy density is just B square over four pi. Right. And then for the matter, it's just your know, H, just your know, specific uh, entropy times rho c squared. So that's that's the ratio. So and so this is these are the jets going in, inside the star. So uh, in a work that I was part of, we uh, did so self consistent launching of jets in inside these dynamical uh, merger ejecta to simulate uh, uh, you know, binary mergers of neutron stars. And there again, you see these sharply dropping profiles of gamma and also energy. Uh, but some other differences, depending on how you initialize the simulation, also occur. For example, in this case, you see this hollow core. Okay, there is density there, there is material there, but it's not moving as fast. So what you're seeing here is the is the gamma profile. So this is gamma shown in different colors. So there, the jet is propagating slightly at an angle, but there's not much uh, action happening close to the symmetry axis. So there are differences that occur between how you initialize simulation. So there's no systematic. Nobody has done a sort of systematic study in, in, in to understand you know when do these emerge? Do they should they should they exist or not exist? So that remains to be done. Uh, how can we probe these things? Now that, that's the most important part. Well, you know, and it's important to probe those differences because that's the only way you can constrain the composition. It, it tells you something very important about the composition of the fluids, and you can do that as I mentioned earlier using attributes. So let's start with you know a top hat jet. And just use this as our, our sort of you know, to practice and to understand what, what should we expect from such flows. 
Well, if you, and then the most important point is you cannot be looking at these jets on axis, basically, you know, down to the core. You have to be looking at it at an angle uh, as a misaligned jet, okay? Where you're an off axis observer. And that's the only way you can probe the structure. Otherwise, you're, you will not be able to, to tell much because the cores are rather flat. So what happens when you're an off-axis observer? Well, in the, in the case of a perfect jet, you don't have any material emitting towards you along your line of sight. Okay, so you don't get much emission, but then as the weaving cone of the, you know, the edge of the jet, there's material there going at high Lorentz factors. As the jet slows down, the weaving cone widens and tries to, you know, become big enough so that it engulfs your line of sight. You see, you see for off-axis observers, you know, uh, twice the angle of the, your aperture of your jet or three times, so on and so forth, you see this rise, sharp rise in, in your afterglow flux, which reaches the peak. That is, that is when you see the core of the jet. And then at that point, you've actually seen all of the jet. There's no more energy to be added. And then you see, because the flow is decelerating, you see this decline in your afterglow. And you merge with the curves that are for an observer that is actually looking uh, head on okay, for, for almost like a spherical flow. Uh, so this is for a top hat. This is from my recent work. I, you know, we, we try to calculate these light curves for these uh, structured flows coming from uh, numerical simulation, those S1, S2, S3 that I mentioned. And you see what's, you see similar behavior, but then there is some shallow, there's some you know, uh, shallow rise to the peak rather than the steep rise all the way through. Okay, and that is because of structure, because they structured their endo. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. So, so why does that why does that rise exist? Right. It exists because you have energy at angles smaller than your viewing angle. There's more energy sitting over there that is being added to your line of sight. So, for example, this is you know uh, this is the angular distribution of energy shown in solid lines for two types of jets. The uh, red is Gaussian jet, blue is parallel jet. Dashed lines are the velocity structure. Uh, and then if you you know if you're sitting here, this is your your viewing angle. Let's say 25 degrees. Then there's this whole lot of energy at smaller angles that is sitting, which will be added to your line of sight as the flow decelerates. Okay. And how, when that happens, when that energy gets added to your line of sight, depends on this theta min, the minimum angle. This is the smallest angle that is beamed towards you at any given time. So initially, you're starting at some angle that is close to your line of sight, which is beamed towards you. And then as the flow decelerates more and more, all the smaller angles become sort of the information from those smaller angles become available to you. And the, the evolution of this depends on the angular structure. So there's an A coming in here, which is from the, the angular structure of your energy. Uh, it depends on that. So you can probe, only probe those angular structures, as I mentioned earlier, if you are a misaligner off axis observer. Uh, so this should be able to demonstrate that even better, this, hopefully this slide, where I'm showing you uh, contour plots of DFD nu, the flux density as a function of solid angle. It's a bit hard to see, I guess, on, on here, but maybe on computer screens it's easier. Uh, and then, you know, correspondingly, all of these, these uh, the phases that you see here, you know, they correspond to what actually happens uh, in, in to light curve. Okay. So initially, when you're at early times here, you're, you're looking at emissions. The emission is coming from along your line of sight. Okay? So the jet axis, where the jet symmetry axis is marked by this white cross, and you're, you're an off-axis observer sitting here. Okay? So initially, you're dominated by material along your line of sight, and it continues, continues, continues. All, at the same time, stuff at lower angles is slowing down. Their beaming cones are widening. So this flux contour, where, the, where it peaks, moves to closer to the jet axis, okay? And that's when you're starting to probe the angular structure, this part here of the jet, until you reach the core of the jet, okay? All the contours are now centered at the jet axis. And that's when you peak, and then you know, follow this sort of, you know, what you expect from even for a spherical flow, this evolution. So, and that's not the only, you know, you see this smooth structure. There is some diversity that you expect. Uh, and, and that depends on this critical angle theta star. And with respect to that angle, you know, are you above this? Your viewing angle is larger than that, or your viewing angle is smaller than that? Okay. And what is this theta star? 
Theta star is the angle below which all the material is strongly beamed away from you, meaning it, you, know, you have to wait for it to be beamed towards you. Uh, and if you're above theta star, that material is not strongly beamed. So you, you, you can readily get information uh, from that material as soon as the, the viewing angle of the material are sitting along your line of sight decelerates. So those are the two differences, and that leads to very you know, interesting behavior in, in the afterglow. Uh, like that. So I showed you on the previous slides this example here, which is you, you see this shallow, smooth rise, and that happens when you're sitting above theta star. So there are a bunch of other lines which I should explain. This red line is, is telling you which angle is decelerating at a given time. Okay, that's this red line. This blue line is telling you uh, which angles are strongly beamed and which are not at any given time. So when you're sitting here, you are not strongly beamed. You're not affected by that. So when we decelerate at deceleration time of the material sitting along your line of sight, okay, other angles, smaller angles, start adding, adding flux to your line of sight and you see smooth. But in the opposite situation, when your, your viewing angle is smaller than the state of star, okay, you decelerate at this point here, oh, sorry, at, at, the, at this point here, but you haven't reached the stage, which is this blue line, right? this angle, you're looking at along this angle, but you haven't reached the stage where you can get information from angles that are smaller than your viewing angle, okay? So you decelerate first, which is here, it happened at an earlier time, and that's why you see a peak occurs, and then this decline, okay? And then when you hit, oops, when you hit this point here, that's when you start getting information from smaller angles. And again, you see this rise happen, okay? Because there's more energy sitting there and it's being added to your line of sight. And finally, you see the full, full jet and then you decline. So these are, these are the various other cases we'll try to discuss in that paper uh, where you have some more diversity, but this is sort of the general idea. But do you see more behavior? Yeah, good question. So, so the problem is we've only seen single event, which, which was this you know, merger of the neutron star. And in that, the light curve looked like this. We were quite lucky to have it misaligned, and you know, uh, uh, it was a big campaign that everybody uh, pointed the telescopes at, and then we have got good quality data, and we could understand. I'm going to talk, uh, tell you about that. This we haven't seen yet, so it'll be very interesting to see. But then it's hard to see because you need, uh, because you're an off-axis observer, you need closer by events to see them. Otherwise, they're too dim. If uh, these are cosmological sources, so uh, they get too dim if you're looking off-axis. So most of the GRBs that we actually see are we're always looking on axis. That's why we don't have much information about the energy state. Isn't, but that, nice. isn't that strange? It's, isn't that strange? No, it's not strange because it's, there's a bias, right? Because those regions are the most energetic regions. They're the most bright regions. So you're, you're biased in, in only detecting those. And the ones that are far away, and you, they are off axis of course. But we can't see them because they're too right? So there's a bias. So what kinds of redshifts would you, what is the maximum redshift? Which so this event that we, sh we saw was in our, you know, sort of cos cosmic back, yeah, 40 megaparsecs. It was a short duration, right? It oh was yeah, short duration, duration. Short. absolutely. Short. So almost redshift zero, pretty so, much. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to observe a case 1A source, yeah. what's the furthest redshift? This one? Yeah. Oh, it has to be, it has to be a nearby event, you know, you, you Within 100, 100 megaparsec. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's hard. So, we're waiting for that. Now, it, it'll happen sometime, you know, hopefully soon, but it, it has yet to happen. Okay, so more information can come from, uh, from looking at you know, the, how the critical frequency of your synchrotron mission evolved over time. Okay. Although I have, I have no idea what, you know, what time is time I have left because that clock, clock is like somewhere else. <laughs> I keep looking yeah, at it just yeah, I'm done. Okay. 20 minutes. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, so I, I mentioned that you have this afterglow emission, you have, you know, you have shock accelerated parallel electrons, and then they emit this synchrotron spectrum, very well understood. Um, and then, you know, it, it has these break frequencies, new A is, you know, self absorption frequency, new M is where where all the minimal energy, the lowest energy electrons are emitting. New C is uh, the emission frequency of those electrons that are cooling at, uh, at the current time, the current dynamic time. Okay. 
And then the difference between this fast cooling, slow cooling case occurs uh, when you know, it, initially all the electrons are fast cooling because the dynamical time is shown. It's only been very little time, and every all the electrons are quickly uh, you know, losing their energy. But when the dynamical times become long, longer, you know, transition into the slow cooling regime where the electrons are slowly cooling there; they're not losing energy at the at the at the same time. Mostly, we're concerned with the slow cooling regime because fast cooling occurs much earlier, so you know, this transition occurs you know, much less than a day or so. Uh, and then, so far, because we we've, we've been looking at GRBs on axis, we have. We have, we have had only information regarding the evolution of basically this new M and new C, okay? In this part of this, this sort of parameter space, which is basically looking at a spherical flow and how the frequencies would evolve in a spherical flow as it decelerates. But more complex things happen when you have a misaligned jet, okay? All this other stuff becomes available to you because of, you know, because there's angular structure. And then you have all these different phases that you go through. So this gives more information. Now, one thing that you might notice is that these slopes for nu m and for nu c don't depend on uh, a and b, you know, the angular structure or uh, sort of coefficients. Uh, so one point here is that well, then it's quite robust. Uh, that is not affected by different a's and b's that in nature you might have from these jets, and you would you would always see this structure quite clearly. Uh, or this evolution in the, in the frequencies when you look at off-axis jets. Uh, but then these time scales where these shifts happen, and this is also reflected in the light curve, uh, they do depend on the, the A's and the B's, especially the A, which is sensitive to the angular, energy angular structure. So, so that information is encoded there, and then one can use that to sort of constrain the angular structure. Right. Uh, and, and, okay, so, other things that can happen, you know, more sort of diversity in terms of when you change, uh, this is, you know, keeping K equals zero, meaning considering only the ISN, changing the angular structure brings out changes in the uh, light curve, interesting things happen. As you become more shallow, and A becomes close to zero, as you become spherical, uh, you lose this, this peak here and you, you only have a single peak. So all of these things happen. Uh, similar things, happen when you change the value of K. That is when you're sensitive to the density distribution of your circumverse medium, okay, the environment. And so there is some degeneracy that you see, but that can be constrained combined in a combined manner, A, you know, constrain A and K together, basically law search. So, so you have all these added benefits uh, that you can use you know, from these uh, studies, from the analytic works, from, from the numerical calculations that I've shown, um, you can try to constrain uh, by comparing that with observation future events. Okay. Uh, so something very interesting happens. So I showed you on the previous slide that you can take A to you know, smaller values. That is when A is becoming, the structure is becoming shallow. So there's a very interesting thing, remarkable thing that happens between these steep and shallow jets. So I showed you on the previous slides that when you have a steep jet, you know, the, the standard sort of scenario, your, your emission becomes gradually dominated by slower and lower angles compared to your line of sight, which is this red curve. But when you have a shallow jet, there's a critical A. So when your A, your angular structure is part of index is smaller than the critical A, you, what we call here shallow jets. It shows a remarkably different evolution of the, your uh, angular region that is you know, do, you know, the dominant region that is uh, producing your flux. It goes the opposite way to larger angles. Okay, and that's demonstrated here. And again, using those uh, those contour plots. In this case, uh, it is oops, it is centered on the jet symmetry axis, and the viewing angle is here. So initially, you're dominated by your viewing angle, and then as time proceeds, you become more and more dominated. That's what these circles are supposed to show by larger and larger angles from your view. Compared to what the case I showed earlier, where you the this contours move from the viewing angle towards uh, the jet symmetry axis. Okay, so there's a very interesting difference that happens. Now, what another interesting thing that happens for shallow jets only is when you're probing the angular structure, when the angular uh, angle that dominates the emission moves uh, larger uh, to larger angles from your viewing angle, you are sensitive to A. So these slopes are sensitive to A. 
So in those in those cases, you can, if you ever get a chance to to get this uh, to observe this, you can actually constrain the angular structure. In those chains. And finally, uh, wrapping up this part of the talk, uh, there's something very interesting happens when you have shallow jets is you get chromatic jet breaks. Okay, so uh, this is so, you know, and that, and the interesting thing is that these a critical values, they depend on which part of segment. You know, I showed you the broken uh, spectrum of the synchron emission. Which part of segment? You know, if you if you're looking at the optical or the X-rays. Uh, it's sensitive to that. So in one part of segment, let's say in the x rays you might not be, uh, you, you might be above a critical, meaning having a steep jet, but in the optical, you might be below a critical having a shallow jet. And because of that, so for, if you're an on-axis observer, you can see the differences between the jet breaks, okay? How, how shallow or steep the, the light curve is in those two different frequencies, which is something interesting. You haven't seen that yet. But that's something interesting that you get in such scenarios. But what we have seen are we have some chromatic jet rates, okay? but they don't look what I'm showing you here. They don't look like this. Okay? What you see here in the optical is no jet break at all. <laughs> and in the X-rays is a clear jet break in all cases, I showed. So this is still a puzzle. This is still a mystery. We don't know what, what's happening. A lot of people have come up with ideas, but still nothing clear cut to sort of solve this puzzle. Okay. Finally, let me spend, if I still have 10 more minutes, uh, let me spend the last part of the talk uh, discussing this golden opportunity that we have. This is the binary nuclear cell merger that we saw for detecting the gravitational waves. And coincidentally, we saw this uh, electromagnetic signature coming from the short gamma ray emission in that case, okay, which happened in August of 2017. This is the, this is the, the LIGO Virgo signal, the chirp signal. This is the merger point. And then, you know, 1.74 seconds later, there was a delay for the electromagnetic emission. The, the, this prompt, prompt emission was picked up by it. You know, this, this, this delay has you know, very important implications uh, regarding the survival time of the intermediate sort of contact object that was formed below the, before the black hole formed, for example, uh, how long it survived for before it collapsed. And you know, jet propagation dynamics, how long it takes for the jet to clear the dynamical ejecta uh, to give you the propagation. So all that time sort of adds up to this one point seven. That's one point I want to mention. But it was a peculiar afternoon, very different from what we had seen before. Now, in all the plots I showed you, especially the early ones, you see this declining emission. Okay. Uh, that changed. So one, two things. First, uh, the prompt emission that was detected was very underdeveloped. It's, it's here. Energy as a function of redshift. It's shown for all the GRBs that are detected by Fermi. The, you should focus on the yellow one. These are the short GRBs. And what we saw in this case was here. The, this is the isotropic equivalent gamma ray energy that was seen, very underluminous. And the peak energy of, of this burst was only 185 keV. Remember, for short GRBs, it's, it's typically is around an NEV or so. So again, very weak. Now, when the flurry of papers came out, when, once this object was released on archive, the discovery of, of that, uh, many of them suspected that we're looking at an off-axis jet, misaligned jet. That's the only way you can explain such an underluminous observation. And then we had to wait for 10 days to see the afterglow. We didn't see it right away. In all cases, we see it right away, pretty much right away. We didn't see it. We had to wait 10 days. And this sort of bolsters the idea and confirmed the fact that we're looking at an off-axis truly an off-axis event, because they take time, there's a, there's a time delay, as, you, as you, I showed you this curve, right? Uh, which rises and then peaks and then declines. So that's what was happening. Uh, and then, you know, people immediately, the first thing you do is, well, okay, how, how, do you, how do you explain that? People started fitting, uh, initially, initially top object models, lost my cursor, and top object models here, for example, and they couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain this early rise that people saw uh, with an initially top. Why do I say initially top at tech? Well, here's a simulation done by Fabio de Coli at uh, Unam, uh, Mexico City. Uh, it's initially, initially yeah, it's a top at jet, but once it interacts with the ISM, it you know, forms this bow shock, right? So it doesn't remain initially top hat, uh, as, as a top hat, but develops the structure on its own. But then we realized that you know, they, they missed something here, these people. And, and the fact is, 
that this shallow part and where it starts agreeing with the data and doesn't agree at earlier times can be pushed to earlier times when you use more sort of realistic simulation because that time when you start you know becoming the smooth here this part here it is sensitive to what is the initial gamma the bulk fact uh, gamma that you use in your simulation so the results this is from our publicly available code and it's the initial gamma in those simulation lines 25 but when you use smaller initial gamma so this time scale at which you see this rise is sensitive to how large gamma is larger the gamma smaller the time so you can push that to earlier and earlier time using larger and larger gamma and you do expect gamma to be to be larger than 100 okay that's the expectation we know that it has to be that case so you could do that so we we kind of relieved you know relax this you know top and you know top and jets were out but okay maybe not so right away because you know you could you could do better but then in the end when you look at this you see that there's a, there's a curvature here which is doesn't which doesn't agree with this sort of power on the rise. So you could do slightly better, but not good. It's still power, top of, top of jets are too yet. So, so you need you need structured jets. Okay. And a lot of people did work on that. This is one of the examples from my study. Uh, where I calculated you know, all these uh, light curves for a Gaussian jet, for a parallel jet, and different uh, energy bands. It agrees nicely with the data. This is still the early time data, just reaching the peak. These are, you know, these synthetic images that you're supposed to see on the plane of the sky. Uh, you know, initially you have just the jet coming towards you. You can't see the opposite jet because it's being away from you. And later, later in time, you start seeing this. So, you know, various nice things uh, in that paper. Uh, and then we made a prediction that when, if you have, so people, you know, early time people, when you have this data, people were still thinking about, well, you can also have a quasi circle flowing on the jet and you can still explain it, and you could. Uh, which you know that quasi spherical flow would come about if you have a choke jet, meaning there's no jet, it's sort of fizzled out, but then you have this quasi spherical sort of envelope which is expanding. And you could explain data with that, yes. But then, if that is indeed the case, in such a case, the flux centroid, right, this bright part, this flux centroid, how it would move away from the where the collision, you know, there where the merger occurred on the plane of the sky. You can actually sort of, you know, in these two models, say, okay, well, this is this is what you would expect in such a flow as a function of time. And if you have a jet, and, and indeed a jet, you would see these huge difference between between the angular motion of that flux center. And then, you know, this is after our work came out. A few months later, um, people had real VI observations, so they measured. You don't even need to resolve the source because you're just looking at the flux center. So it's it's pretty. You know, beautiful method to actually constrain to this. And they found that it's you know 2.7 milliard seconds over so this period of time, which I've shown you here. And the prediction was okay, you know, now going back to our work saying, okay, well, how did we do? We have two milliard seconds. Well, within the ballpark, but the idea is much larger than what you would expect from this green curve, which is the cause of spectrum. So clearly you have an optimistic jet and not a not a choke jet. So you know everybody at that point is this is like a smoking gun that it is basically. Uh, all right. And then we have you know, more recent data shown in recent work to and still agree nicely with uh, structured jet model. This is from another study. And even further now, I mean, we're just beginning to lose the X-ray emission, so it's pretty much will be done. But this is sort of the latest point, you know, at 1,200 days or something post merger, and it still agree quite nicely with the structured jet model. So everything is is well and good. When you have this is my last slide. So when you have, uh, when you understand the, the angular structure, other things become uh, sort of, you know, you can, you can start to constrain other things. So one of the things that we did is constrain the anisotropy of the magnetic field that is produced behind the shock, the external shock, right, which propagates in the SM, to try to understand what is the, what is the anisotropy of that. Because once we, we don't understand that fully. Uh, and that, if, that you can constrain using, uh, Polarization, linear polarization. We only have upper limits. That's what I've shown here. But let me, before I, before I get to the plot, uh, in general, you can sort of characterize the anisotropy of this post shock magnetic field using you know, this psi, which is simply the ratio of the magnetic field along the shock normal divided by the one that is in the plane transverse of the shock normal. And that evolves behind the shock as a function of radius or the self similarity variable. 
in some manner. But what we're trying to constrain is this psi f, which is the normalization, which is the anisotropy of the magnetic field just immediately behind the, the, the external shock. Now, there are studies, theoretical works, which suggest that these magnetic fields in, in this collisionless ultra relativistic shocks are produced by some wide instability or filament mutation type instability. And most of those, the magnetic field produced must lie in a plane transverse to the shock normal, which means this psi f must be much, much smaller than one. This ratio must be much, much smaller than one because we, the dominant field is the one that is transverse. And pick simulations, a lot of the people that pick simulations of that, and they also find this is, this is the case. Mind you, the pick simulations that people do are, uh, they don't have much dynamical range yet. So they don't probe the interesting scale that one needs to probe, but this is sort of the status quo. Okay. But, okay, so this is the polarization curves that you have for different values of this psi f, which I've shown you. If psi f is indeed small, close to zero, kind of the minus two, for example, then you get these red, these red curves. And if it starts to becoming larger, you get down in polarization. And we have these upper, you know, these upper limits. So what we see that psi f cannot be as small as, as close to zero. It must be somewhere between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9, which means more isotropic than, than, than I am isotropic. So that completely refutes this idea that you have this vital geometry. If something else must be happening, something else that we don't understand, we're not modeling yet is giving you more sort of uh, isotropic fields than this magnetic fields that are completely in the plane normal to your truck. Okay. So that's the power of, you know, when you understand the angular structure, you can start doing all these things and start sort of understanding collisionless shocks. And there's, these happen in various other objects, so it's good. Once you understand them here, you can understand them elsewhere. So that brings me to my conclusions. So I've shown you, uh, you get uh, into the structure. Now, now we know uh, from numerical simulation, as you come out of this confining medium, you, you get that. Uh, we, learned, sorry, we learned that from, from observations of GW1717. You need any structure. We still need systematic studies that needs to be done for both hydrodynamic jets and MHD jets to sort of understand the differences between the two and how we can actually start constraining those when compared with observations. So those studies have to be done in a systematic manner. All of these aspects, how the light curve changes and how it depends on these, these your viewing angle, the, these parallel indices that I talked about, we can, you know, all the stuff, results that I showed you earlier, uh, they were derived from analytic work and then compared with numerical simulations and then agree quite very nicely. So you can, that's the power, it's a powerful tool that you can use to verify, you know, if you have a simulation, use that. Uh, that analytical results to verify that you're indeed getting the correct answer. So that's good. good that's a good check. And you can also, you know, as on a fast time scale, fit to observations as well using the, that uh, results. And finally, the most important point uh, is you can, you know, this is we can get constraints on these jets, and these constraints are very, very useful uh, to understand. The composition of the jet. This is the central question, the holy grail, basically, of GRB physics. Once you get the composition, everything will fall in line. Okay, and we don't have a good handle. So, so I'll leave you at that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ramadeep, for the uh, very enlightening and thought-provoking uh, talk. So, uh, I'm going to ask people on Zoom to raise your hands. In the meantime, I will ask some questions in the auditorium. Okay, Rosa. I have two questions. Well, so how many more uh, GRDs are there? One thousand times the orders of magnitude? Oh. Because now you see the long ones. Yeah. Now you see the ones on axis. Yeah. That's one question. And the other question: Will future are there being planned future observational facilities that we like to see many because you need many? Yes. yes. So we see. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, for yes. The, uh, louder. Yeah. Yeah, thank thanks you. for reminding. <laughs> So the question is, how many of these, you know, on-axis GRBs, especially the long GRBs, we see, uh, we've seen so far, and uh, with that, how many more are there? Huh? How many more are there? Of three orders of magnitude, or something. the ones that we don't see. Right, right. So, um, right. So, so that's one question. How many more are there that that we haven't seen yet? So basically, what is the rate, and you know, how many we, we should see? 
if you want to see all of them. And then uh, are there any new instruments or things that are happening in the future that will allow us to actually probe that? So yes, there are, we only see the ones that are beamed towards there, obviously. So there's a huge beaming factor. So there are a thousand more, right? That F sub B that I showed, 10, 10 to the minus three. There are more out there uh, that we haven't seen compared to what, what we've seen so far. We've seen, I don't know, upwards of 2025. Uh, so there's a lot more out there that these, especially these dim events. You see, most of the solid angle is occupied by these dim events. Right? Only smaller solid angle, that's where the jet is being, right? Is what we act, we're accessing at the moment. But there are a whole lot of others uh, at larger view in the angle that we're not seeing. So obviously, in order to see those, we need more sensitive telescopes. Uh, so now, and there are many more being launched uh, in, in the near future, hopefully. Uh, Athena is one probe, which hopefully will happen in the next 10 years or so. Um, JWST, definitely looking at, you know, high redshift GRDs that will come. Um, and a few other smaller, uh, uh, I'm part of a couple of uh, missions that are in sort of the proposal and having been accepted now in the building stage that are, that are going to look at these dimmer events. Uh, so from here on going forth, I, I mean, uh, it will improve obviously, but then we need something similar to what we saw in the 17 and 17 event, closer by uh, off axis event, you will not find most likely any long duration, but short, yes, uh, which you will see. And that will definitely increase much more our understanding of it, as, it, as this, this event doesn't really. And what's the rate of those? Oh, the rate, hmm, that's a good question. I don't, sure. I, don't have, I don't have the number written down yet, but uh, maybe I can get back to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Susanna, you had a question? Yes, I, I wanted to understand more the, the last uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. You spoke a lot about the rings of the your structure, but I understood earlier that if you had a magnetically dominated jet, then you have a hollow cone. How mm -hmm. would you probe this hollow cone? Right. It exists. Right. Okay. So the question is, uh, I showed hydro jets and, and MHD jets, and then there's some differences between the MHD jets. You have this hollow core that I mentioned. Uh, how are you? You know. Are you sensitive to those and how, how do you probe such a structure when I mean, you have uh, MHD flows? Well, the, the answer is, uh, well, first of all, we don't know if it, indeed that thing is happening. Uh, that's one simulation which we, well, we've seen that in other MHD simulations as well. So it might actually be. But then in the end, so what you end up seeing is this annular ring rather than being a filled up, you know, a uniform core jet. Instead of that, you have some missing emission in the central parts. But then you have this brighter annular ring around it, which you can see. It, it, it is very similar to, uh, it, if you're looking on an axis, it will give you a mission very similar to a spherical flow or a flow. And things will not change uh, much, not even, not, not at all actually, if you were to look at a, uh, an off axis angle. Because all you care about is what is the structure where this annular ring is and above, uh, angles larger than this annular, annular ring. So, um, if you're looking, if you're looking right down the barrel of the jet where this you have missing emission, you will not be able to tell. You can, you, because you're dominated by emission in that annular ring, and it's just like a spherical flow. You cannot tell the difference. In that regard, yes, it's a challenge. Thanks, Suzanne. Jesus. Yes. Yeah, so in those simulations, in the simply hydrodynamical ones, yeah. If you get, let's say, a synthetic X-ray emission, it should. Had a different luminosity than the one without the with magnetic field because X rays are prone to be excited in the instabilities. So my idea is that if these people who pr provided the simulations have they produced synthetic observations and compare the differences between the three, for example, these three yeah. scenarios, are the observations different or similar? Right, so the question is what from these, uh, if you look at the synthetic images from these simulations, can you tell differences between uh, these narrowly sort of, you know, a core dominated jets or the ones with, with more wings? And if I understood you correctly. Uh, and the answer is, well, it, it, it all comes down to using, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the Afrigo observations of misaligned jets, and only then, if you can constrain 
that parallel index, if it in the end happens to be very close to being a smooth sort of top edge, and as you as you see here for larger magnetic fields, uh, then great. Uh, but there's no, at, at the moment there's no way to tell because we only had one source. Right? We need more of those to give us more I, more indication of what kind of flows we're dealing with. And if there is some universal structure uh, that is there, and have they produced such synthetic images? No, they haven't. So. Uh, what we have done is use their simulation uh, simulation results where they give the angular structure profiles, use those, and uh, produce our own light curves, use our own way of sort of explaining where the differences in the light curve and images and other things are coming from, given these angular structures, and also say, well, in hydrodynamic simulations, you have this sort of universality, these common features that you see in MHD jets. Although it's not so clear yet because not a lot of people have done so, so many of those studies yet. So that's why I mentioned that one needs to do a systematic study of both hydro and MHC jets and then see when compared to an observation what nature performs. Because just looking at the image, if this is density, the colors, yeah. you have less density but more uh, instabilities in the top. Okay. So, it should have so it's a more spread object. It should have an impact even in the luminosity in the optical and the x ray. No, so, okay. So I thought of this. Okay. Let me answer that. So that it doesn't it doesn't affect uh, the luminosity. It doesn't affect the spectrum. Basically, the spectrum everywhere is the same because at every point of the jet you have a shock produced, and that you have electrons, and they're all emitting synchrotron emission. Okay, but the energy at, at those is different. That's the only the luminosity is different that is produced. That's that's the difference that you see. And then you do see those things in the light code. Thanks, Susan. Sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. So I would like to know if those, uh, the, the generators you mentioned with A and K, mm. do they affect the other models you talked about, or they only affect those models? I am oh, they, right. So the question is, uh, and I showed the degeneracy that you, sorry, yes. yeah, this slide. Between the angular structure and between uh, when you have uh, density gradients in your circumverse medium, uh, does that affect the, which uh, which one would you say? Any kind? Okay, so uh, I would like to is those those parameters yeah. they do affect the other models you talked about. They, they affect everything. Oh, okay. they affect everything because in the end there is some structure. Okay. And some structure is producing you know this afternoon emission, but when you try to constrain it. You don't know what K, but in this case, you can separate between short GRBs and long GRBs, right? right? So short GRBs, if that's what, what your question was, K is zero. They are in a very clean environment. Okay, there's no gas around, so, so it's constant density ISM. But in the long duration GRBs, there is, because you have massive stars, they have winds, uh, so they sort of embed the, the density gradient in, in those winds. And that's what the jet propagates to. Then the value of K. This is a you know very interesting question that comes up on a lot when modelers, people, and observers, they're trying to uh, fit to observations. They always tend to choose K equals zero. K equals two. Two is meaning that you have this constant velocity wind. That's when the density goes R to the minus two. So that those are the favorite cases people I tend to pick. And sometimes you know uh, observations get misinterpreted because they didn't allow themselves the freedom. For picking different values of K, and that may indeed be the case. K could be one, right? And that changes your interpretation in the end because many things, all the things I showed you today, are dependent on K. So that's a very important parameter. And, and people have not made the, the effort yet to try to go in that direction because, in the end, you have to deal with there are a whole lot of parameters and you don't have enough information. So you're always under constraint. Uh, so you have to pick something, right? That's what you know, I'm not claiming that the observers uh, don't don't do that. Well, it's just it's it's hard. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, okay, one more question. Yes, I have two questions which I can answer. Uh, the first is uh, the magnetic jets uh, simulations. The magnetic field is helical around the jet. Yes. Oh well, it it. It depends how you how you uh, initial initialize. So some simulations do have a toroidal field, like a helical magnetic field. We don't see that it comes down to uh, understanding how the jets are launched and how the magnetic field is anchored in the disk 
and there's an increasing risk which is giving you some magnetic field. We think it could be on large scales polyloidal, but it may not be. You can also have helical, as you mentioned, helical magnetic fields uh, that can you know, give you such flows. And now this is a very interesting question because you can probe those things with linear polarization, which I haven't talked about. Maybe next semester. We can talk about polarizing. Hint, <laughs> hint <laughs> second, second question is, uh, could this study be applied to another kind of jets, for example, AEN jets or star jets? All right, so question is, you know, can we can we apply this, all of this, what I talked about, to AGN jets? Well, AGN jets, we understand, I think, slightly more than GRP jets because they are, they are, you know, highly resolved. We can see them uh, long distances. We can, you know, even in, in our department, people are, are measuring the direction of magnetic fields. Uh, in Nietzsche's work. So uh, we can see those. Here we can't. These are unresolved sources, a point like sources. We don't have any information uh, of those things. So indeed, yes, so this, what I discussed, the physics remains true for those things, but we have a better idea already of what they are. They're magnetically dominated. You see these helical magnetic fields, and then you know, uh, the whole structure, larger scale. Here we go. Oh, thank you. Actually, yes. Okay, uh, do we have any questions on Zoom? We have time for one more question, if you have any. Okay, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.